Bible is an amazing book. The Old Testament tells the story of how God created the world perfect, how sin and corruption entered the world, and how God began to rescue the world. God's rescue plan was that he was going to send a special certain person someday who would fix everything wrong with the world. This person was called by various names in the Bible over the centuries, such as the Seed, the Branch, the Angel of the Lord, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Christ. The Bible tells how God helped his people who believe in him throughout the centuries and preserved the Jewish people and how prophets foretold that the Messiah was going to be born as a Jew. Then the New Testament tells about Jesus the Messiah who was born when and where the Old Testament predicted, lived a perfect life, taught his disciples about God, was killed by the religious leaders, and paid the eternal penalty for sin for those who believe in him. Then he rose to life again on the third day as the Old Testament predicted. He ascended into heaven and is coming back again someday to finish the process of ending all evil and restoring peace in the world. But is all this really true? It's a nice story, but is it historically accurate? Did God really create the world? Or did life arise spontaneously from chemicals in a warm little pond somewhere and evolution create all the rest of life? Did God really part the Red Sea? Did Abraham and Moses and David really do the things that the Bible said they did? Did Jesus actually say the things the New Testament records, and did he really rise from the dead? C.S. Lewis said that Jesus would either have to be a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. But is it possible that Jesus might simply be a legend, based on exaggerated tales that his disciples made up many years afterward? In this video, a set of videos, I'd like to focus on some common objections that we often hear about the New Testament, and show some evidence for why it's trustworthy. I'll start with two objections that are easy to answer and move to the ones that are harder. And then at the end, I'll present several positive reasons to trust the New Testament and some resources to study if you want to like to live, uh, if you'd like to dig deeper. Here's a timeline overview of the Bible. The Old Testament started being written many thousands of years ago. And Abraham was about 2000 BC. And then Moses, a couple hundred years later, David was about 1000 BC. And then Jesus, who's called the Messiah or Christ by Christians, is about 2,000 years before the present time. And then the New Testament was written right after the life of Jesus by his disciples. And there was a gap of about 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. One common objection is that the Bible has been translated so many times, so there's no way to know what it originally said. The idea is that as the message got translated, it got more and more confused each time as it went between languages. Of course, it's true that the Bible has been translated many times. It's the most translated book in history, with parts of the Bible translated into more than 3,400 languages. But we today have ancient manuscripts that are written in the original languages. So we can base our modern translations directly on the manuscripts rather than on the translations. The New Testament was written in Greek, and we have more than 5,800 Greek manuscripts for the New Testament today. Likewise, we have manuscripts of Old Testament books in the original Hebrew and Aramaic languages. So this objection is easy to answer. Another objection we'll sometimes hear is that the stories of the Bible were passed down orally from person to person, like the telephone game. When you get a line of people, and you whisper a sentence to the first person, and so on down the line, they whisper it to the next person, and by the time you get to the last person, the story has been radically changed. The objection says that if we can't get even one sentence transmitted successfully over 10 minutes, how can we expect the hundreds of pages of the whole New Testament to be transmitted accurately over many years of this process? There's several key differences. First, the time of the oral transmission was only about 20 or 30 years at the most, and it's been written down for the past almost 20 centuries, and this written form makes it much easier to copy the words correctly. We'll talk about the textual variants in a moment. Second, the stories about what Jesus did and said were written down by eyewitnesses in the case of Matthew and John, and by friends of eyewitnesses in the case of Mark and Luke. So the accounts are either first-hand, Matthew and John, or second-hand accounts, in Mark and Luke's case, not more than that. We'll talk about the process in a moment. And third, the original autograph manuscripts and their first copies could be copied from many times directly, instead of just copying from the last one in line, as in the telephone game. And finally, we'll discuss this more later, there are many quotes from the New Testament by early Christians, known as the Apostolic Fathers, which confirm the text of the later manuscripts and show that the Christians at that time had copies of the New Testament books in their possession. 
for example, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, were three Christians who lived in the first century and second century who knew Jesus' apostles personally, and they quoted from several books of the New Testament in their own writings. And also Papias of Hierapolis uh, shared an early history of the Gospels in Matthew and Mark. So unlike the telephone game, these multiple early witnesses to the original teaching of the New Testament help to confirm its accuracy. And these fathers' writings are a whole century closer to Jesus, actually, than the earliest surviving manuscripts we have today of the New Testament books. Another objection is that there are many textual variants between different manuscripts. This is a true fact, and the reason is that all hand-copied manuscripts from the ancient world have some variants, not only biblical manuscripts, but all other authors, too. We have about 5,800 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, and another 10,000 Latin manuscripts and 9,300 from other languages like Syriac, Ethiopic, Coptic, and Armenian. So in total, about 25,000 handwritten New Testament manuscripts. Only about 60 of these are complete copies, and the others are fragments. But when you hear fragment, you might think a small piece, but the average length of these manuscripts is more than 450 pages long. Some of them, probably most of them, are from the Middle Ages, but there are quite a few from the first couple centuries after Jesus. There are approximately 400,000 textual variants or differences in words or spelling between the New Testament manuscript, according to scholar Bart Ehrman. So critics say that the Bible has been changed so much by all the copying over the years that these variants make it impossible to know what the original New Testament said. Now here are some thoughts in response to this objection. First, because we have so many manuscripts, most of the original text can be easily figured out by comparing the manuscripts. This process is called textual criticism. Most modern Bible translations list common variants in footnotes, so you can see for yourself what the different possibilities are. You can look also at online resources. For example, Wikipedia has a very nice list of the most common variants. Here's a couple pictures of the uh, one of the older codices parchment here, and two small papyrus fragments, which are very old, uh, probably from the first century, papyrus P90 and papyrus P52. So there are four kinds of variants classified by whether they're viable or not, and whether they're meaningful or not. Viable refers to how likely it is to be in the original, and meaningful is whether or not it changes the meaning of the passage. Most variants are neither meaningful nor viable. About 70% of the variants are simply spelling differences. Only about half of 1% of the variants are both meaningful and viable. And interestingly, none of them affect any core doctrines of Christianity. Let's look at a couple examples together. Spelling differences. The name John was sometimes spelled with two new letters in Greek, and sometimes with one, and the manuscripts will often show differences on this. Another example is that some words in Greek could often either be spelled with or without the letter nu at the end. This is called the movable nu, but it does not change the meaning at all. Sometimes variants show as the presence or absence of the definite article in Greek, or rearrangement of the Greek word order, which doesn't change the English translation. In fact, if you were to write the simple phrase, Jesus loves Paul in Greek, I've heard that there are at least 16 ways that the Greek words could be arranged for this which would have all the same translation and meaning in English. Another category is variants that change the meaning, but since they only appear in a small number of late manuscripts, it's easy to see that they're not part of the original. For example, Luke 6.22. The early manuscripts contain the entire verse, but one 11th century codex is missing the phrase, on account of the Son of Man. So it's easy to recognize and eliminate that late textual error. Likewise, 1 John 5.7, a very famous one. Out of about 500 Greek manuscripts of John, only, uh, first John, only four manuscripts contain this added verse. And the earliest of those four is from the 10th century. So it's obvious that this was not in the original text. All modern Bible translations explain this in a footnotes or margins. But it doesn't change Christian doctrine at all because we have many other verses that explain that God is a trinity. It's taught in many other sections of scripture. Two more well-known variants that are not viable because they're not in the early manuscripts, as best we can tell, are Mark 16, 9 through 20. This is called the longer ending of Mark. And there's also a shorter ending, likewise, uh, which is um, not found in the earliest manuscripts. 
and John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the pericope of the woman caught in adultery. But again, these do not affect Christian doctrine at all. Jesus' resurrection is found in Mark and also in the other Gospels. And the story in John 8 is interesting, but it's not necessary to understand um, who Jesus is. And the last category is the meaningful and viable variants. Uh, for example, 1 John 1, 4. Here's an example. Uh, one set of manuscripts says we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Another set of manuscripts says we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. So we're not sure which is the original, but it doesn't change the Christian core doctrines at all. Our Muslim friends will often make a particular claim about the Bible, that is, that the Bible is corrupted. And so they say that's why we need the Quran, which was revealed in the 6th century. They say that the original Jewish scriptures, which the Quran calls the Torah and Zabur, and the original Christian scriptures, which the Quran calls the Injil, have been changed so that what we have today is different than the original. When one of our Muslim friends says this about the New Testament, I think we can gently ask them a couple questions. First, we can ask them whether they've ever read the New Testament for themselves, or if they're just taking others' word for it. Next, ask whether they're referring to little textual variants among the manuscripts, or to massive changes in the text to turn Jesus from only a human prophet into the divine Son of God that the New Testament describes, who came to die and give his life as a ransom, and who rose from the dead. If they say they're talking about just the little textual variance between manuscripts, then you can ask them whether the textual variance in the Quran manuscripts are a problem for trusting the Quran, because the Quran also has textual variance. On the other hand, if they say they're referring to complete corruption, you know, that the original NGO was completely different than the one we have today, drastic changes that were made in the text to change Jesus so much, you can ask when they think this happened, before Muhammad or after Muhammad. If they claim that the corruption happened before Muhammad, you can ask why the Quran repeatedly affirms the preservation, inspiration, and authority of the Gospel, which is called the Injil, that the Christians at the time of Muhammad had in their possession. Literally, the Quran says, between their hands. Or, if they say the Bible is corrupted after Muhammad, then you could look with them at the hundreds of New Testament manuscripts we have from before Muhammad's time, showing that there were no major changes compared to the Bible we have today. There's a free video on the internet called The Quran, the Bible, and the Islamic Dilemma by David Wood, which is really excellent at discussing and um, dialoguing about this topic. And the link is in the supplement.